humans could not exist without animals. Within the ecosystem, every animal, from the largest mammals to the tiniest of insects, has a vital role to play in the well-being of the planet. A report published by the National Academy of Sciences shows that there has been a biological annihilation of entire species in the last few decades, due largely to human overpopulation and overconsumption. We are, scientists tell us, in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. The survival of human civilization is under threat, and we have just a short window of time in which to act. In the past 50 years, half of the world's forests, wetlands and peat beds have vanished. We've lost 400,000 square kilometers of permanent sea ice. Dr. Ian McCallum is a specialist wilderness guide, author and poet, and director of the Wilderness Foundation. The total population of wild animals in the last 50 years has halved. If you want to know what's happening in Africa, we're losing an elephant every five hours for its ivory. The fate of the rhinoceros is no different. We're losing one animal every eight hours for its horn. And we are begging an incredibly important question as far as I'm concerned. What kind of a madness is this? Why are we doing this? And why are we allowing this to happen? And could it be that we don't want to know? All major religions of the world praise creation and acknowledge that humankind depends on nature for its own survival. It could be said that the opposite is now also true. With the rapid destruction of natural habitats in the last century, animals, insects and plants now depend more than ever before on human protection for their survival. But there are a few promising signs. Some of the world's religious leaders are speaking out strongly about the responsibilities of religions, all of which state they are stewards and protectors of the natural world. Faith communities, and my own in particular, should take responsibility. And hopefully we are beginning to face up to that responsibility. And one has very key leaders speaking out plainly in a completely different way. Um, most notably at the moment, uh, the Pope, Pope Francis. When Jorge Mario Bergoglio was elected as the new Pope in March 2013, he chose the name Francis in honor of Saint Francis of Assisi. He said, for me, he is the man of poverty, the man of peace, the man who loves and protects creation. These days, we do not have a very good relationship with creation, do we? In his 184-page papal encyclical titled, Praise Be to You, Pope Francis says, We are not God. The earth was here before us and it has been given to us. We must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute domination over other creatures. When he wrote this strongly worded statement, the Pope may just have heeded some advice from Ubuntu for Animals, a group of dedicated South African animal rights activists. One of our uh, first activities was to submit a pet petition to the Pope. That was in uh, 2013. And there was a compilation of a range of protests and appeals and brought together in a very beautiful graphic way and delivered to the Pope. Um, took two years to get to him and to be acknowledged on the 21st of September 2015. A report by the World Council of Churches states, 
we will resist the claim that anything in creation is merely a resource for human exploitation. We will resist species extinction for human benefit, consumerism and harmful mass production, pollution of land, air and waters, all human activities which are now leading to probable rapid climate change and the policies and plans which contribute to the disintegration of creation. Rav Abraham Yitzhak Cook, first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel, wrote an essay in the early 20th century about a vision of vegetarianism and peace and about kindness to animals. This consciousness has been embraced by Rabbi David Rosen, former senior rabbi in Cape Town and chief rabbi of Ireland. He has joined more than 70 rabbis worldwide who have signed a declaration urging Jews to embrace veganism. The rabbinic term used for animal welfare is actually tsa'ar ba'le chayim, which means the suffering of animals, which is something we have to try and avoid. Rabbi Hillel Avidan has been an animal rights campaigner for most of his life. When I first started uh, preaching, writing, appearing on radio and television in Britain and so forth on this subject and allied subjects, very few of my rabbinic colleagues were interested. They weren't even that aware of what Jewish teaching had to say on the subject. Now, of course, all rabbis are involved in uh, bringing uh, awareness of animals and their needs and their rights, because they certainly have some rights, and uh, they're all concerned about the environment as well. The Quran, the Hadith, and the history of Islamic civilization offer many examples of kindness, mercy, and compassion for animals. Islam teaches that animals should be given equal consideration to humans. The Prophet Muhammad said, it behooves you to treat the animals gently. Everything is our responsibility, and, uh, and where we see a wrong, we've got to rectify it, and we've got to lead by example. Dr. Ayub Bandurkar is a veterinary surgeon based in Cape Town. He says that animal abuse, cruelty and neglect form part of the many social ills plaguing the Muslim community. The uh, problem is people come in and they want to have the dog euthanized or put down or given up for adoption because they feel it's Ramadan and they're not allowed to keep a dog. And there's no way in the Quran where, where that is a, uh, or in the teachings of Islam where we have to give up one's dog because of that, because it's Ramadan. So we got Skyla here. Yeah? What has happened to Skyla? Yeah, Skyla uh, suffered a um, severe blow of uh, oh, like the impact on the, oh. as you can see on the left, uh, uh -huh. radius of Ilna. Um, oh, it must have been a blunt object because there's no external, there's no external wounds, uh -huh. as you can see. Yeah. If you look very carefully, um, that happened say, uh -huh. about five days ago. Okay. And meanwhile, Dr. Bandurkar also sits on the board of the NSPCA and regularly assists with injured animals at the Cape of Good Hope SPCA in the suburb of Grassy Park. I do lots of work in, in the animal welfare industry and what I do find is that uh, many times it's ignorance. Um, there is a, a genuine care for animals. Uh, many people are, are ignorant of how to care for the animals or they've seen how People in the past have done things and they feel that is the right way and they just go about doing it. Uh, for instance, we sometimes uh, get bullet wounds, you know, um, yeah. that cause fractures, uh, baseball bats mm. uh, and uh, stab wounds. Mm. So yes, uh, the message would be, you know, if we can help the society, social, political mm. as well yeah. and economical, uh, that I'm sure with the right education they'll be uh, more prepared to look better after them, yeah. you know. And how many options do you get per day? So, we strive for 100 a month. According to Belinda Abraham, spokesperson for the Cape of Good Hope SBCA, she and her staff are constantly exposed to animal abuse. Yes, there are some very traumatic things that we do get exposed to on a daily basis. Um, dogs that have been cruelly treated, or dogs or animals in particular that have been uh, used for the purposes of human entertainment, things like dog fighting, horse racing, um, that have just 
you know, been beaten within an inch of their life. The Cape of Good Hope SBCA was established in 1872 and for the past 146 years has worked tirelessly to carry out their mission of preventing cruelty to animals and to providing veterinary care and advice to those communities most in need. You know, kindness costs nothing. Um, if you see somebody being unkind, try to correct that behaviour and do so with kindness too. Um, I, I really do believe that, that if people are being taught to love and respect animals, the love and respect that we should be showing each other as a human race, will, it will extend to that. The drought is also having an, an impact on yes. uh. a lot of the communities, these ability mm. to be able to feed their animals. Okay. So we should be asking ourselves, are we teaching our children, are we giving them the right message, are we teaching them to be kind to all living things, because ultimately that will prevent them from getting involved in violent crimes and committing violent acts against a person later in life. has a very unique friendship with Elliot, who should be around here as well. Uh -huh. um, Elliot is a goat. Taking children for walks in nature, taking them to, to places like animal welfare societies or, or zoos that are ethical zoos or, or nature reserves where they can interact with animals and, and respect animals and even the animals that you see, the birds that you see flying in the parks to teach them that respect and if you are keeping a pet, teach your children how to feed them, how to clean their, their cages or their, their kennels in the garden and, and to groom them properly. In his award-winning book, Ecological Intelligence, Rediscovering Ourselves in Nature, Dr. Ian McCallum addresses the interconnectedness of all living things and ultimately the survival of the human animal. Every mammal has more than 90% of the human genome. Birds, reptiles in the 80s, insects in excess of 40% and so on, all the way down to trees and plants. 10 to 15 percent of the human genome, thank you very much. So in, a, in, a, in many respects it begs the question, well, where do we come from? And it's in this light that I say we come from the wilderness. Dr. McCallum says there are many lessons we can learn from the natural world and the creatures which inhabit it. The first thing, to survive as a wild animal, it has to be awake, it has to be alert, and it has to be aware. Well, it's exactly the same with us. We have to be awake. We have to be alert to what is going on around us and we have to be aware of the presence of the others. What else is there? You know, I think we can learn an enormous amount from other animals. And we do so because, because we're actually uh, evolved We've evolved with other mammals. Bishop Jeff Davies is the founder and patron of the South African Faith Communities Environment Institute and often referred to as the Green Bishop. They show all the emotions that we have. And when people say, oh, animals don't have feelings, they don't know what they're talking about because they've got the same nervous system that we have, We're exactly the same. I think there's a need for education, there's a need for, for information sharing, there's a need for, for, for capacity building. Mandla Kwamlana is the company relations and campaigns coordinator at SAFSI. There's a need for people to begin to understand that uh, uh, animals are living beings as much as men are living beings and that animals uh, have feelings, they feel pain as much as we do, and that our existence on Earth is about us coexisting with animals.
Bishop Davies says that a discussion with his mentor in his early 20s sparked the revelation that his true calling in life was to stand up and speak out for those that are the least able to articulate their suffering. Everybody is, is under the authority or needs to recognize that there are transcendent values which we cannot overturn. If we do, we do it to our uh, own disastrous consequences. Um, so we're all obligated, I think, to, to follow and to recognize that there are values which are greater than ourselves. Nikki Buerta describes herself as a civil society activist. She's passionate about bringing effective change to situations where animals suffer and is not afraid to motivate action to inspire others to actively fight for a better society. Well, I've done many things. I've documented the dolphin slaughter in Taiji. I've documented the cetacean slaughter in the Faroe Islands. I've documented the Yulin Dog Meat Festival in China. Um, I've documented the Namibian seal hunt. So whenever there's an opportunity to help animals, I do it. There's you know, so many different projects that I'm involved in because there's so many different levels of cruelty that we meet out to animals. Hindus consider the cow to be a sacred symbol of life that should be protected and revered. In the Vedas, the oldest of the Hindu scriptures, the cow is associated with Aditi, the mother of all the gods. And yet, the most horrific event Nikki Burta has personally witnessed was in Nepal, where 80% of the population is Hindu. There is a festival in Nepal called the Garimai Festival. It happens every five years, and it is in honor of the Hindu goddess Garimai. So, you know, if you sacrifice an animal to Garimai, Garimai will bless you with a son, or if you want good results in an exam, or if you just need a little bit of good luck in your life, you sacrifice an animal to Garimai, and she will then bless you with the luck that you need or the good fortune that you need. Now, as I said, this festival happens every five years, and it's estimated that between, let's say, about 275,000 animals to five, over 500,000 animals are herded into a huge slaughter arena and then ordinary citizens will have cookeries which is a traditional weapon that is then blessed by the priest. You can't just go in and slaughter these animals, you have to have your weapon blessed by the priest. And then once your weapon is blessed, you go into the slaughter arena and you literally hack these animals to death over a period of two days. And that would then be the mass religious sacrifice of animals to the goddess Garimai. And obviously, you know, the more the animal suffers before or during death, the slaughter process, the more the goddess is appeased. The Gadimai festival is condemned by most Hindus as a barbaric act that brings shame and embarrassment to a largely animal-loving faith. And according to Hindu scholars, it's a misunderstanding of the teachings. The tribal society in Nepal, because they are warriors, they believe that by performing that sacrifice, they get power and valor, etc. These are all distorted thinking of our Vedic scriptures. The Vedic scriptures never allowed any sacrifice. Kill the animal within you. That's what the Vedas have told. But without understanding that, I tried to kill an external animal and sacrifice it for benefits. It is a misunderstanding, and that's why the animal sacrifice has come into existence. Animal sacrifice was common in many of the world's ancient cultures and religions. Uh, we had animal sacrifice right up until the year 70, of the common era, Christian era. That was the year in which the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And thankfully, we've had no animal sacrifices since then. Christianity too abandoned the practice, 
but it is still common in Islam during Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice. The ritual slaughter, which is um, commonly called the Qurbani or the Udhiya, it is uh, it's done at the end of the Hajj period, and it's, it's the second Eid. Slaughtering is not the problem; it's how to go about slaughtering. So. In Islam, we are taught by the, in the prophetic example, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave many instructions on how to treat animals. We are not even allowed to slaughter one animal in front of another. We shouldn't even sharpen the knife in front of an animal. And when we do slaughter, the knife need, needs to be so sharp that the animal hardly feels any pain. And then we need to wait until the animal is completely dead. Another subject of great concern to animal rights activists is the use of animals in laboratories. It's estimated that in the USA alone, between 50 and 100 million rats, primates, dogs, pigs, cats, sheep and rabbits are used every year in laboratory experiments. One of the things I campaigned against at one stage was uh, animals used in laboratories. Thousands, maybe millions of rhesus monkeys have been slaughtered over the, over the years in, in, to, to find medical solutions for medical problems, human problems. I know in terms of experiments, lots of animals that uh, are killed, they have cruelty to them, and we could be more, more, more caring to God, the Creator, who created them first in terms of the Bible. Archbishop Tabo Makhopa has given up eating meat as a sign of respect for suffering animals. We, humanity, Adam was last, it was after God had created everything and he said it was good and he said let's create a humanity in our own image so we need to revere God's creation. A modern-day revival of Indian spirituality can be seen in the Hare Krishna Food for Life movement, the world's largest vegetarian food relief organization. Food for Life organization is basically um, a food relief program that's uh, on an international scale. Locally in South Africa, it was a very informal, humble beginnings where there was a humble kitchen in Chatswood, just seeing to the nutritional needs of uh, school-going kids in, the, in and around the Chatswood area. The organization has grown to 28 branches nationwide, ranging from Cape Town all the way to Soweto, serving more than 15,000 meals a day. The emphasis is on preparing healthy, meat-free meals. Uh, like in the instance of the cosmetic world, the beauty industry, we have beauty without cruelty. Food for Life has adopted the same ethos, where we have nutrition without cruelty. And the idea is to educate people that um, the source of the nutrition, the source of the foods, should be ideally from a non-meat um, background because you are what you eat. The movement is also well known for setting up and supporting animal sanctuaries worldwide. Here we're currently at the Sri Krishna Gorashana that's situated in Thornville in KwaZulu-Natal Midlands. The word go in Sanskrit is cow and shala in Sanskrit is a home. So this in English terms is a home for the cows. There are nine cows at the Goshala, most of them rescued from abusive situations and nursed back to health. Visitors have the opportunity of close contact with these peaceful creatures. There's many interested people um, around KZN and also out of the province that uh, share a, a very close relationship with uh, nature as well and animals in general. So we host these groups and we provide, uh, in some instances, we provide seminars, we provide, uh, you know, a little bit of education around the project and the Gorshara and introduce them to the cows. 
In accordance with Hindu Dharma, cows must be protected. Shamit says that just as soldiers on a battlefield try to protect the flag of their country, the cow is a flagship of Sanatan Dharma, the eternal truth and teachings of Hinduism. Protecting the cow is symbolic of protecting Dharma. In Hinduism, cows are revered, um, you know, the main reason being that they are considered to be our mother. Um, if you look at uh, when we born as human beings, we, we drink the milk of our mothers, so um, the animal is primary, you know, the primary animal that gives us milk and she provides the, the, the entire nation with milk. The sanctuary is equipped with modern cleaning and feeding facilities for the cows and is seen by Hindus and Hare Krishna devotees in particular as an inspiring reminder of the loving manner in which Lord Krishna tended cows. The cow is the most revered animal in the land of Krishna as well. Krishna is the, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In his pastimes, when he appeared on earth, he appeared in India in a place called Vrindavan. And there Krishna had 900,000 cows and he knew each single cow by their name. And he used to tend to the cows every day together with his dad and his brother. And um, the cow is the favorite pet of Lord Krishna. We perform something called a Go Puja, again in Sanskrit Go, like I said, meaning the cow, and Puja is a prayer in Sanskrit or Hindi as well. Um, we perform this prayer with its origin being in our Hindu scriptures called the Vedas. Therein it prescribes the worship of the cow to be very important in the life of a Hindu, and I would say in the life of anyone. So what happens is we enable the person to gift the cow to the Goshara and it's written in our scriptures in the in the Hindu Vedas that if one gifts a cow in its lifetime, then another person enjoys happiness for the rest of his life and thereafter as well. When you spend 45 minutes or half an hour or 15 minutes in front of one of our cows, you develop a personal relationship with them. And over time, over the months, and now over the years, we know that they recognize us and, and we can recognize them. And we see them not anymore as cows or as animals, and we see them as actually and sometimes higher than our human beings. And I look at them, and sometimes when one tries to be naughty with the other, and one tries to be um, a little bullish with the other, you'll notice that their, their entire you know, mentality is not that of retaliation. Their entire mentality is just that of peace. So the sanctity of life is proclaimed by the great sages and seers of Bharata Varsha, the Hindu saints and sages. It is said that the great sages in the Himalayan region, they never plucked the fruit from the tree. They waited for the fruit to become ripe and fall down, and then only they will take it and consume it. That means no harm should be done to the tree or plant or any living being. That is the principle behind the life evolved by the great Acharyas. And when we come to the animal realm, it is considered to be all the more sacred. Many of the world's religions and belief systems say that human beings have a non-physical body, an invisible essence. The Eastern religions talk of the Atman or Jiva, while the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Islam and Judaism refer to this essence as the soul. You know, some people uh, say, do animals have souls? And, and I like to say, well, I, I can't answer conclusively. But I do know, I know that God loves everything that he has brought into being. And, and just if we're promised, if we have the spirit uh, which continues in the hereafter, um, then I see no reason why another creature could not have a, a soul or a spirit. I truly believe animals have souls. I think all animals, how can they not? Like this. <laughs> 
It's never been something that I've had to debate. Obviously, it's a living thing. Animals come from God and they'll return to God. So their souls, they have, but a soul is different to what humans have. A human has a choice whether we wish to submit to God or not. And to be Muslim means to submit to the will of God. An animal, just by following its instincts that God gave it, is following and submitting to the will of God. So all animals, in our, in our opinion, are Muslim because they submit to the will of God. I believe with all my mind and my heart and my soul that animals have souls. I could give you a theological argument to justify that position. I could quote authority like uh, Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis. But for me, most important is that all I can say is that by the grace of God, I personally experience the souls of animals. The Farm Sanctuary SA is the brainchild of Joanne Lefson and was officially opened on World Farm Animal Day, the 2nd of October, 2016. So this is now uh, Rosie. Hello, Rosie. That's Rosie. So we have a handful of rescued farm animals that reside here and call this their home, and we invite the public to come into the space to connect with a farm animal and hopefully in this connection, it awakes a journey of compassion. Located in the Franschhoek Valley in the Western Cape, the sanctuary serves to instill an awakened connection between farm animals and visitors and aims to inspire a positive change in the way society views and treats farm animals. And you know she loves a, a belly rubber. Rosie! What? She'll roll over. You know, farm animals today are on typical industrialized factory farms is where they live and consumers have no idea how these animals are treated. And so this is a positive project aiming to inspire people to come make a different kind of connection, not a connection at the supermarket, but with a living farm animal and to go, wow, these animals are actually amazing, individual, incredible beings. And we actually owe it to them to add some empathy in the, in the food system. Meet Picasso, big, fat, and friendly. Joanne says she loves the simple things in life, eating and sleeping, and she also loves to paint. Picasso was rescued by Joanne when she was a baby. One day, Joanne gave her a paintbrush and some paint, and she's never looked back. We aim at everyone that wants to come and meet these farm animals. You know, many times people come and say, oh, you've got to bring the kids here. But actually, all the kids have a natural empathy for farm animals. Um, it's often when you grow up, you, in our cultural conditioning, we lose touch with, you know, we love our dogs, but we don't love our, you know, our, our cows and pigs. So actually, it's for everyone. Frank Moltino is a regular visitor to the farm sanctuary. He says he experiences a deep sense of peace and serenity when in the presence of the childlike innocence of these gentle creatures. The key thing is to nurture that natural compassion and empathy that children seem, seem to have. It tends to get stomped on. And all we need to do is, is just protect it and let it grow. Affirm it. Don't call it silly. Don't laugh at it. Don't say that you'll grow out of it. Frank is a devoted Christian and leader of the Animal Justice Program at SAFSI. So SAFSI is the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. We're a multi-faith NGO. Um, our vision, in a way, says it all. Uh, communities of faith caring for the living earth. Uh, we seek to speak with voices of faith, 
into the environmental issues uh, facing our world and facing our fellow creatures uh, and we envisage a, a world as far as animals are concerned where no animals are suffering um, inhumane cruel treatment and conditions uh, and where we as humankind are, are living in benign and compassionate relationships with our fellow creatures with whom we share the earth. Frank is also responsible for organizing the feast day of St. Francis in October every year. At St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, we have a tradition that dates back years of having an annual blessing of animals at the time of the Feast of St. Francis, St. Francis Day, which is the 4th of October. Most uh, people know uh, the patron saint for animals, uh, Francis. Uh, Francis uh, is known to have been a follower from a wealthy context, and uh, but out of his love uh, for, for for animals, um, he gave all that he had. He created uh, safe spaces, beautiful gardens, and he looked after after the animals. And then even today, uh, most churches when we remember Francis, people bring their dogs and things <laughs> to be blessed uh, by clergy. So over the past two years, we've had a great multitude of dogs, cats, birds. Last year we had a, it was a lamb, two horses, all gathered with their people right up around the Lord's table, signifying the inclusivity of, of God's love uh, in His church, in God's church. So blessing the animals themselves, the individuals there, blessing uh, the organizations working for and with animals, praying for animals in general, praying for an end to cruelty and inhumanity practiced against animals. All of this is the purpose of this annual Blessing of Animals event at St. George's Cathedral. Animal rights crusader Philip Wallen says, we may be Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain or Jew or no religion at all. But if we are to live a truly authentic life, we must share common ground without sacrificing our other beliefs. That meeting place is universal kindness, the essential trait that spans our faith traditions. Wild animals are authentic. They are unutterably themselves. Okay, and we envy that. We would love to be unutterably ourselves, but we cannot be. This is the human struggle, really. We are pulled in three different directions, where the biological forces is all about being exactly who you are, unutterably yourself, and this is where the animals dominate. When it comes to social species, you start living your life out with expectations. Who am I? Who am I supposed to be? Who would society like me to be? The Oxford English Dictionary describes kindness as the quality of being friendly, generous and considerate. It does not say we should only be kind to human beings. Anybody who has a spiritual belief or are following a particular path in their faith um, would definitely be embracing of kindness to animals, compassion, um, and, and caring for all living things. 
Kindness to animals is not a modern concept. In the 6th century BC, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras said, for as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Italian artist and engineer Leonardo da Vinci spoke about a time when humanity would look upon the murder of animals as they now look upon the murder of men. And Irish author George Bernard Shaw wrote, The worst sin towards our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. That's the essence of inhumanity. The key text was Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 3, verses um, 12 to 15, where he says, Holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, above all with love, which binds everything together in harmony, in perfect harmony. The Quran starts off with the words Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It says, in the name of God, the most merciful, the always merciful. And we want God to have mercy on us when we leave this planet and we return to Him. And in order for us, for God to have mercy on us, we need to be merciful to all our creation, to our fellow creation, whether it be animals, whether it be humans, whether it be the trees and the plants or the earth. Many modern religious leaders have taken up the call for kindness. The Dalai Lama says, animals deserve our compassion. We must know their pain. We should nurture this compassion through education. I think there's this assumption that to change um, the world we need to be doing major things but it's really I think one of the things that I learned from my meditation is just I just need to do what I can the best that I can because then I go out and I impact someone else I treat someone differently and they encourage to treat someone differently and that act just continues and that's how you get a better planet. Our existence on this earth is not the pinnacle of all that is. We are part of a whole. We must first and foremost begin to respect all those that are on this earth with us, our fellow inhabitants. The revered biblical scholar Rabbi Joseph Hertz stated that care and kindness to cattle is of profound importance for the humanizing of man and that cruelty to animals is among the most serious of offenses. Being created in the image of God means that we have to show mercy, compassion, we have to be just in the way that God is. That's what imaging God means. The Art of Living's Sri Sri Ravi Shankar says that every creature on this planet brings down a particular electromagnetic wave on the earth and even if one creature goes missing, the earth would not be able to sustain itself. Love and compassion f is, is for everything. There is, if you look in a flower, there's love in the way a flower is created, in the way the stars shine, there's beauty in everything, and that is included. God made animals as well, and you could argue that he made them for us, but I would argue to say that he made them for us to be a part of our existence, to, to, to enhance our existence, not to abuse and to destroy. Nelson Mandela has been called the world's greatest statesman. He said that the truest freedoms and the greatest liberation are deeply connected to an endless love for humanity. And this love extended to animals too. He was the patron-in-chief of the NSPCA from 1994 until his passing in 2013 and was committed to wildlife conservation. He made this powerful appeal to the people of Africa. If we do not do something to prevent it, Africa's animals and the places in which they live will be lost to our world and her children forever. Before it is too late, we need your help to lay the foundation that will preserve this precious legacy long after we are gone. Compassion and kindness is the central tenet of any spiritual path. I believe kindness can be a whole religion if it's practiced and not just preached. Without kindness, one could say that spirituality is uh, empty or devoid or unable to translate the teachings into a model for emulation, progression, growth.
As a tribute to the wildlife of Africa, Dr. Ian McCallum wrote this poem. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul, where every tree and bird and beast is a soul maker? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a moving feast of stars, footprints, scales, beginnings? Since when did we become afraid of the night, and that only the bright stars count? All that our moon is not a moon, unless it is full. By whose command will the animals, through groping fingers, one for each hand, reduced to the big and the little five? Have we forgotten that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earthly blood, and that we named them? Have we forgotten? And wilderness is not a place, but a season, and that we are in its final hour.